here to talk about this, the future of society and new ways of learning, or at least I will attempt to, because the more you listen to people who want to predict the future or to want to pretend who know how the future is going to be, uh, I can tell you they're all wrong. No one knows what the future is going to be. So what I'm going to do is to provide you some perspectives that I think might be useful in, uh, in thinking about the future. So a little bit of context. Uh, this is Singularity University. How many of you are familiar with Singularity University? OK, three of you. So Singularity was started by these two gentlemen uh, here, Raymond Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. They're both uh, inventor futurists and kind of change makers. They had the idea of starting a, well, it's not really about the singularity. It's not really a university, but it's the closest thing that it gets. Um, it's, a, it's an institute and a research center and a um, kind of an incubator and all sorts of wonderful things uh, in the NASA Ames Research Park in Silicon Valley, California, in Mountain View. And the goal is to try to improve the lives of at least a billion people in less than 10 years by leveraging exponentially growing technologies. So technologies that double in either quantity or quality or both or price performance uh, every year or every two years or so. So you double steps by steps and you grow exponentially. So you go from a very slow growth at the beginning, apparently slow growth because you're doubling very small numbers. But then at some point it gets really, really big. So if you want to get to a billion at step 20, so you do 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So basically you get up until the very end, it looks like nothing is happening. And then in less than 10, 10 steps, you do everything. And that's what happened, for instance, with the genome. Um, it was, I think, a 12-year project. They spent something like $7 billion on it. And uh, seven years into the, yeah, it was, it, was six, it was six years into the program. It was the seventh year. They completed 1%. And the skeptic said, well, here you have spent $4 billion. You're seven years into the project, and you're done 1%. It's going to take 100 years. And the, you know, everyone else who understood exponential said, no, we are right on schedule. Because next time is going to be, next year is going to be 2%, and then 4%, and so on. And in fact, they finished exactly on time, and they complete the project. And now a genome doesn't take 12 years or $7 billion. It takes about 25 minutes and $1,000. And in a few years, it's going to cost pennies. So think about that for a second. So this is the context. Uh, I was there last summer. I wrote this book, Robots Will Steer Your Job, But That's OK. And um, when I ran the world to speak about that. The reason I think lots of people are interested is because I talk about jobs. So I, I was at TED Vienna, and I gave this slide and say, OK, if you know anybody who does any of these kinds of jobs, well, tough luck, because robots will steal them. And at the beginning, I got laughter. But and they thought I was mad, actually. Um, maybe the, the people in TED, they were already forward thinking. But I've been speaking about this issue for a long time. And when I first started, they thought I was mad. Uh, a few months later, this is the front cover of Wired Magazine, the number one uh, technology magazine in the world. Look. It's a, it's a guy on a suit with a tie, a robotic hand. Robots will see your job, but that's OK. A guy in a suit with a tie, robotic hand. Robots take over. They're coming for your job, and you'll be glad they did. Uh, they never mentioned me, but that's OK. <laughs> and Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, Robots and Robert Barron's uh, editorial of New York Times and front page. So maybe not so mad. And the reason is. Well, here we have a research that just came out from Oxford Martin School of Economics. 45% of America's occupation will be automated within the next 20 years. That's their prediction. Right, they just came out a few weeks ago with this report. Um, and I actually spoke with um, Anders, the, um, Andrew Sanders, the, one of the people who co-authored the paper. This is the actual paper. Uh, Carl Frey, Osborne, uh, and others. Uh, um, and these are the headlines that we see all the time. Right, US unemployment, long economic nightmare continues. Uh, the Eurozone is doing even worse. 
So this is the US civilian labor force participation rate. So here, time, 1940 to today. This is the percentage of the population which is able to work, and it's actually working. And you can see these are the recessions. These gray lines are recession periods. So you can see it used to be following a cycle, but now it seems like it's just a downward spiral. And then you take another graph. Corporate profits after taxes. So except the 2010 bust, the financial meltdown, it looks like corporate profits are doing pretty good. In fact, if you, if you, do, you, know, if you do standard deviation of that, it basically doesn't exist, the 2010 crash. You put the two things together, you have record profits, all-time high, and simultaneously record low in, an, in employment. How is that possible? Well, obviously, when you're dealing with economics, there are lots of factors, but I think automation has a lot to do with this. Uh, because look at this, 1980, recession. This is the recovery. It's a straight line, 90, 90 degrees, right? And then shallower, shallower, shallower. This is called an almost jobless recession, which means jobs disappear, the economy slows down, you have a recovery because you have profits and productivity going up, but not many people employed. This is exactly what I predicted, and others, um, due to automation. So Europe is better, a bit better, or is it? Look, percentage of those aged 18, 24, not in employment, education, or training. So basically people who are neither studying nor, uh, are, nor are not looking for a job, which I think should be counted, but it's really hard to find those numbers, uh, because the, it's most likely that they've stopped looking for a job because they gave up, not because they don't need it. Uh, and they're not even in training. 28% Bulgaria, Italy, yeah! Greece, Ireland, okay, you guys are doing pretty good. It's, you're even not even in the chart, but it's probably here, Netherlands, this is the same, but you get the point. It's not a very rosy picture. So some evidence of automation. You know Kodak? Anybody here old enough to remember Kodak? <laughs> Okay, so it was the world's giant. They had 90% market share. Kodak was basically synonymous with photography. Um, 145,000 employees at, at their peak. 2012, bankrupt, minus $1 billion revenue. Same year, Instagram, 13 employees. Look at the numbers. It's three orders of magnitude, precisely. And they were sold to Facebook for a $1 billion. Kind of ironic, and even more so, when you realize that the first commercial digital camera was invented by Kodak. The same exact technology that put them out of business was invented by them. And the reason they went out of business is because they didn't understand exponentials. Just like the critics of the genome said, oh, it's going to take 100 years. Here they said it's going to take 1,000 years. You know, that 0 0.01 megapixel, who's going to use that? Well, soon enough it's going to be 100 megapixel. And now you have phones that with 100 megapixel cameras. Um, Foxconn, it's worth $100 billion, one of the largest multinational corporations in the world, 1.2 million workers. They're automating the factory. Army of 1 million robots already replacing human labor. First robots already arrived. Canon is doing the same. Walmart, largest multinational corporation in the world, 2.1 million workers. Could they be automating? Yes. Amazon is already doing it. Kiva System was bought for 70, $775 million, automated warehouses. Um, all the components, individual components for automating most jobs today, some would argue 30%, some would argue 50 some even 80 or 90%, but most of the jobs today can be easily or um, accessibly you know, uh, automated uh, in a very short period. And just take a look at this picture. This is the number of people in the United States working in the motor vehicle industry. About 3.8 million people. Can you see this pixel? It's one. OK, it, it's like, you know when you see like the sun and the earth in, si in scale? Yeah, that's pretty much the same. OK, so these are the number of people employed in the driverless Google car. 
Do you see a problem? Anybody? So, okay, let's be realistic. 100 is very conservative. Let's say new industries come in. They're going to do apps, all sorts of you know, things that you are going to have developers, uh, OD, Volkswagen, uh, all sorts of car manufacturers going to get in. Okay, let's put this two orders of magnitude more. Ten, you know, 10,000. No, oh, three orders of magnitude. 100,000 people working here. Okay. Take 100,000 out of this. Do we still have a problem? So this is the autonomous car. Uh, you know, the kind of Jetson-like futuristic car that drives by itself without a driver? And yeah, it's as cool as it sounds. Uh, I know because I was there. Really cool. Um, so it has all sorts of sensors, sees uh, in 360 degrees. You know, 3.8 million people. Working on that is about 2.6% of the uh, working population. But this is just the beginning, because if you look at lawyers are being replaced by software, 45% um, of law graduates in 2011, in 2012, could not find a job. They were either underemployed or unemployed. Um, same goes for diagnosing. Uh, so medical doctors are being replaced. Um, robots can detect cancer better than uh, uh, oncologists and uh, experts in the field. They're already aiding through uh, smart robots that extend the ability of the surgeon, but now they're also doing autonomous surgical robots. More reliable than the best surgeons, right? They don't shake, they don't sweat, they don't go, oh my god, what did I do? Um, they do, um, they are better pharmacists, and you kind of see a pattern. In my head, this is not a picture of the US motor vehicle industry. This is a picture of eventually any industry in the world, given enough time. You take away 3.8 million jobs and you create 100,000. The rest, gone forever. So this is a problem, because if you look at Google, Facebook, and Amazon, together, and Apple, um, they're worth a trillion dollars, but they only hire 150,000 people. This is completely different from the past. In fact, this is from my book. If you look at the time scale, the closer you come to today, the fewer employees, the more revenue per employer. So companies are making more money, employing less people. This is exactly the trend that I was describing before. So you take anything, account, retail, manufacturing, translation, journalism, scientists, physicists, anything. It can be eventually automated. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal said the software is eating the world. OK, um, now what? Any ideas? Sending out the mission. <laughs> That's what I'm to do it. OK. Ideas, come on. Don't be scared, shoot. Holiday. Holiday. Okay. Actually, organize. Organize. The company, when they first started you know, doing the car, they thought um, they weren't making the car efficient enough, so they made the conveyor, the, the line, uh -huh. and people thought that was going to become to humanize people. And yet, the unions came in, yeah. and learned to organize, and they created better jobs, better right. working conditions, which right. wasn't existing before. Sure. Same thing with this. What to do? We can actually create better working conditions for ourselves. Uh huh. Because I'm a big proponent of open source. Yeah. So okay. Good. Argue. Good. So, so it's hard to say exactly what to do, but uh, here are a few ideas. Uh, let's put things into perspective. If you increase productivity and corporate profits go up, employment goes down, and purchasing power, on average, goes down. So you have a small fraction of the population richer and richer, but the vast majority, the purchasing power is falling. So that brings you to inequality. So here is a study they did. Again, this is the US, but Europe is not so far away, we'll see later. So this is what, they, they ask a random sample of thousands of people, what would you like the distribution of wealth to be in your country? Okay, so top 20%, second, third, fourth, okay. So basically, you know, this is not communism, right? The top has 
way more than the bottom, but not disproportionately. I mean, it seems fair, right? This is what seems fair to more than 90% of the people who were interviewed. This is what they think the situation really is. So very much worse. And this is what it actually is. This is kind of mind blowing. I mean, they don't even register. They're basically a, a slit of one pixel. So, but this is kind of hard to picture. I, I have another picture. This shows the actual distribution of wealth in the United States. Look at these ones. Th they don't even have a coin. In, in, if you take $1,000 worth of, you know, every block is worth a dollar. They don't even have one, zero. And the 1%, they need a whole column of their own. In fact, the 1% has more wealth than the bottom, I think, 45% or 50%. This is what it actually is. Um, and this is Europe. Well, the rest of the world, Japan, Finland. So how much richer are the richest 20% as opposed to the poorest 20%. So the worst is Singapore, USA, Portugal, UK. OK, now with increased automation, this is only going to exacerbate this problem. And it brings to even more inequality. And the question is, why should we care? Right? Why is equality important? It's proportional to social issues. Uh-huh, OK. Like Social unrest, yeah? Anything else? Uh, I read a study um, that the most stable economies in countries yeah? are the ones with a very large, healthy middle class. OK. So good. So morals aside, because I think there is a moral argument to be made, um, morals are kind of hard to measure. <laughs> so let's talk about economics and social indicators. These are standard numbers that everybody agrees on. So this is data, OK? Child well-being is better in more equal countries. Drug use is more common in more unequal countries. Educational scores is higher in more equal countries. Health is better in more equal countries. Homicides rates worse in unequal countries. Rates of imprisonment, infant mortality, prevalence of mental illness, uh, more obesity in unequal countries. Social mobility is lower. Look, United States has the, one of the lowest mobility, social mobility. So people don't really change jobs because, well, they don't have health care and <laughs> they don't want to lose health care. But if you don't have a problem, like, hey, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, oh, I see a pattern. <laughs> Teenage birth. Look at that. USA right there. The worst. Not just by a little, by far. Look at that, staggering. Japan, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium. And this is, uh, maybe some of you noticed, you know, it's always Wilkinson and Packet. It's, this is actually not a single source. They collected hundreds of different sources and put them together in a book called The Spirit Level. And this is um, from Nature magazine. Using statistics from reputable independent sources, they compare indices of health and social development in 23rd and 23, the world's richest nations. Uh, striking conclusion, societies that do best for their citizens are those narrowest income differentials. So this is uncontroversial data, regardless of your moral code or um, your political swing. So we know that absolute inequality is bad, and absolutely equality doesn't work. Uh, it's demonstrably not working uh, and has not worked in any uh, attempt historically. So. Obviously, we need some kind of balance. Um, and what is fair? Uh, well, we can take Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Seems like a good point to start. You take the bottom, the physiological needs, breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, you know, these kind of things. OK, can we provide to every person on the planet these basic needs? Is it possible, technically, today? So basic needs could be considered a human right, now that we have the technology to provide for people. I know that it, it, in Norway this seems so obvious, because you guys have such uh, a good social substrate. But in most countries, what you have as a given is a dream. And the United States is one of them. 
Okay, not Somalia. Um, so how do we get there for 7 billion people? And not just for the Nordic superstars. Um, well, the devil is in the details. So there are a few proposals. Um, one proposal is to do lots of reforms. Uh, international agreements and uh, all sorts of reforms. Here is um, various tax reforms that have been proposed. For instance, in uh, Switzerland, they, just, they, they are voting now for a 1 to 12 ratio between the lowest paid employee and the highest paid CEO. So if you make 1,000 euros a month, the CEO can only make 12,000 euros a month at most. Pretty big, considering that in the United States, it's 1,500 times just naturally. There is no limit. And in some cases, it can be up more than 1,500 times. I mean, this is kind of staggering. So I understand that someone who's doing a very important job should earn more, but thousands of times more. Is it really somebody's work or life worth thousands of times that of somebody else's? Doesn't seem like that fair to me. Um, there are, of course, education reforms. The problem with this is um, schools are very <coughs> slow to reform. It takes a few years just because of logistics, right? And in this exponentially growing world, things in six months are obsolete. So you, you, it takes four years to get the new program in the school, and it's already obsolete. Like, you don't want to learn that. Uh, so, mm, big problem. You promote innovation. There are various ways to do that. There are incubators, social uh, uh, startup uh, programs, uh, private, uh, public uh, mix of the two. Um, and it seems like pe they're trying to give people jobs, just, just to keep the economy going, just as an inertia mechanism. This is how the economy has been, and this is how the economy is going to be. Uh, and if they're, even if these jobs are useless or detrimental. So if you think about someone who's like a patent troll, it's basically destroying small research centers or companies who are doing innovation with a fake um, patent or copyright infringement. And basically, they're shutting them down to prevent them from innovating, from doing something good for the planet or for humanity as a whole. And they are. Uh, they're now a large part of the economy. And this is completely unknown to the general public. And this is just one example. Another example, oh, again, of patent trolls. In India, farmers, they could not grow their food because they had to buy every year a infertile seed from Monsanto. So it's a seed that cannot create a new seed. You know, like a mule is, cannot reproduce. They did the same with, by genetically modifying the seeds so that these farmers, they were basically enslaved to the company that had for 25 years this sole right to sell them that kind of organism, that life organism. And they are patenting life forms today. They have thousands of patents on life forms. So this is kind of scary. Um, and then there is a different kind of proposal. Again, Switzerland is discussing this right now. Basic income guarantee. So I've looked into this, and uh, the data is inconclusive because we have no data. So it's an experiment. Um, the idea is you basically give, this is 2,500 francs, so that's about 2,000 euros a month, to everybody unconditionally. Wow. Like to everybody, rich and poor, good and bad, doesn't matter, uh, young and, you know, 18 and more, everybody gets 2,000 euros a month unconditionally. You work out the math, you can find the money. It's about a third of the GDP. With that, you don't need any other social programs. So it's like the libertarian dream. But if that's the case, then unattended consequences may happen, such as, well, if you don't have any social, social programs, why should you provide healthcare? 
just have the private sector take care of it, let the market decide, and people can spend the money because they have the money. But in an inflexible market such as healthcare, because if you're, if you're going to die, you're going to pay whatever amount, prices go up exponentially like it happens in the United States. So very tricky how you implement this. It might work, might, might be a disaster. I have no idea. Um, and then there is another proposal. So it's surely a combination of good reforms and new ways of thinking, but I think not to sustain the system that existed before. I think we should be using all sorts of reforms and new ways of thinking to create a new system. Right? Something completely different, something that's not based on the assumptions that we have made up until now. Because otherwise, we're just going to fall back to the same problem. It's a cyclical problem. It's just going to come back sooner or later. So we need to rethink the way we think about labor, value creation, and distribution. And I think we should be creating what I call an open source society. And we should be transitioning towards that goal between now and 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. How long does it take? I don't know. So here are my three Ds. Okay. You digitize, you democratize, and you distribute. You digitize because today everything is digital information. Even this table, this computer, this bottle of water, the water itself, it's digital information. You can digitize everything. Not just ideas and books and paintings, but physical objects, life forms, everything. If you democratize the access by publishing the blueprints, the DNA code, or the source code of the program or whatever you create, it becomes accessible to all. And you can distribute it using technologies such as the internet that allow for um, basically anybody on the planet to receive that kind of information. So what do you do? You start by opening research. So any publicly funded research, I think, should be open source, the result. Even if there is a public-private public cooperation, which is usually the case, it should be a viral thing. So whenever you have one cent from public money spent into any project, everything within that becomes open source. Just imagine the sheer size of innovation on one side and benefit for humanity as a whole would come just from one single piece of legislation that opened up all sorts of any kind of research that had public funding in it. And of course, you open the software, public administrations, cities, smart cities. They're starting in Brazil, in uh, Copenhagen, even here in, uh, in Norway. What if all the source code that runs the cities and the waste management system and the purification system, you know, everything, what if all of that was open sourced? Replicating what a virtuous city is doing somewhere else would be easy and would be fast um, and would be cheap. It would be actually, you know, be close to free. And you open hardware. I don't know if you guys have heard of the phone blocks, but the idea that, you know, these phones that we have, they are, well, intrinsically obsolescent because um, you can't put something that lasts forever. Uh, and they're planned obsolescent because they, they are made to break down at a certain point because you have to keep cyclical consumption. But if you made something to last and you open the designs, you open the hardware, you can just replace the part that's broken or obsolete and plug in something new. Right? You make modular designs. With cars, there's an open source car initiative. With 2,000 euros, you can build an entire car, a functioning car, today. You go to a website, you download the CAD, you can make your customizations, you send it back, and they send you 3D printed parts or extraction molded parts of the car, and you have a car that you made yourself with 2,000 euros. And this is today. Okay, it's called opensourcevehicle.com. It's completely free. Um, so you open science, you open culture, and that changes your values. Right? You don't promote growth, you promote resilience. You don't incentivize secrecy and NSA like bullshit, but you incentivize radical openness. Uh, that brings you to have less competition and more collaboration. That's what I call an open source society. So 
whatever solution we come up with, because this is a direction, obviously, the details are obviously difficult to predict and takes a lot of time to make them. But whatever solution we come up with, I think an essential component will be learning. Here, you're all here to learn. I mean, supposedly, you're students at a university, so you're here to learn. But even if you're not a student at a university, you have to learn new things every day, especially in a world that changes every day almost exponentially. So how many of you are familiar with MOOCs? OK, so MOOCs are massive online open courses, like these guys, Khan Academy, Udacity, Coursera, edX, that's MIT, Harvard, uh, and uh, Princeton, uh, Udemy, Sebastian Tran. Uh, it's Udacity, the guy from Google who made the Google car. He did the first uh, artificial intelligence course with 120,000 people simultaneously studying online for the first time. Two years ago, I was part of the project. And um, I'm working with a company that provided them with the technology to caption, time code, and translate their entire class. And they translated it into something like 56 languages in five days. So this is the power of the crowd, potentially. So these are some of the, you can go online to any of these websites and learn a world-class education for free from the best universities of the world, Harvard, Berkeley, Toronto, you know, Rice University. Um, here, Coursera has dozens, uh, you know, s dozens of partners, uh, Stanford, uh, um, Khan Academy. If you don't know about Khan Academy, you should check it out. It's amazing. This guy has an uh, incredible story. Um, in Europe, we don't have much of this problem because education is um, embedded in the social structure. So it's free to us, apparently, although we pay with taxes. But you know, um, but in many, in many other places, it's not. Like the US and uh, less developed countries, it's, it's not a given. Uh, in fact, the cost of education is skyrocketing. We know that innovation is growing exponentially. Um, computers are getting better and better. They're beating even the masters of uh, puns and uh, tweaking language uh, in a weird way and understanding context and things of that sort. This is Jeopardy, the, you know, the all-time winners of Jeopardy uh, against IBM Watson, completely destroyed, just like happened with Gary Kasparov in 1999, the biggest the, the, the greatest uh, chess grandmaster who lost to IBM Deep Blue in 1999. So yeah, now you graduate and you say, how about that job? Sorry, software replaced you. Um, so that whole thing that you've seen, I love it. Um, but I think it really takes just the traditional model of somebody explaining something, taking a video of it, or, you know, and then transferring information to a group of students, they have to learn and take a test. It's basically the same that's happening in traditional education, just online. I think it doesn't really challenge um, the assumptions that we made for thousands of years about how we should learn. So are there new ways of learning? That's what I ask myself every day and try to come up with an answer. Um, so some of the problems with, with massive online open courses, the first one is that, as you might have noticed, they all come from the United States. OK. Uh, and most of them are only in English. Khan Academy is a good uh, exception. Coursera is starting timidly doing some other language courses. But only 6% of the world speaks English natively. 6. 6%. And 73% of the world speaks zero English. Zero. Zero. Nada. Yet. OK? The, they don't understand anything of what I'm saying right now. 73% of the, it's about, you know, it's almost 5 billion people. So if you really talk about changing you know, the way we learn and doing an education revolution, and you don't think about 5 billion people out of 7, maybe you're missing something. I don't know. It's just, maybe it's just me. Uh, another problem they have is that they have a 90% dropout rate. It's great. It's this course in, uh, I don't know, um, toxicology or you know, environmental chemistry, whatever. You take the course. Watch a couple of videos, and then you're like, oh, and you drop out. 90% of the times, this is what happens. And I think because, well, I was there not so long ago, you know, that side of the table. So I remember that the, the way I learned the most was 
in small study groups, three to five people try to understand something and explaining to each other and kind of just thinking, you know. Um, it was essential. Most of my learning that I did, I did in small study groups. And uh, almost no one's really exploring this, this possibility online. And another, I think, important aspect is mentorship. So having a great teacher is, I think, essential. But having somebody who can motivate you at the personal level, like really understand who you are as a person and give you advice, being a mentor. I think that's, that is the climax of learning because you're really engaged when, when somebody gives you recognition and guidance for something that you're passionate about. Um, so the third problem is that the tools are not available to all. So you've seen these, these online courses. The individual components, creating videos, or putting it online, or translating the videos, or making student projects. So the individual components for learning in a new way, I think they're, they're all there, but no one has put them together. So there is no complete platform that takes mentorship, small groups, um, creating videos, putting up online, uh, distributing them easily uh, at the level of granularity that you need with the type of license that you want, Creative Commons uh, uh, or whatever license you want, and being able to translate from any source language into any other source language. Uh, there is simply no platform that does that. So I said, OK, I'm going to build it, because uh, learning is not really democratized yet. Um, it's getting there, but it's not there yet. So I said, OK, I'll make it. And this is, this is what I started. It's called Explore. And it's basically trying to address all of the problems that I mentioned. And trying to solve them. Uh, so it means to, sorry, means to seek out knowledge in Esperanto. Um, and, uh, and this is the mission. All of the world's knowledge should be made available to anyone on Earth, regardless of their language, geographical location, or financial status. So this is what I think about every day. This is what I try to accomplish. And um, I think we are moving towards a society where more than earning a, a degree, although it's still very relevant, uh, it seems to be that something maybe even more relevant is to acquire and learn new skills. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love universities. I did my degree in computer science, artificial intelligence, it was great. But I think they're not the whole story, right? There are many things that you want to learn that are not taught in schools. Or they might, they might complement what you have learned in school. Because um, I think learning is forever. It's not between age 5 and 25. Learning happens when you're 2, when you're 50, when you're 100. Uh, you always have something to learn. And um, so I'm trying to make this project happen to let anybody in the world be able to learn anything. And this, the website is explore.net. But if you Google Explore, you'll, you'll find it. Um, so I want to leave you with... Um, a note, so, you know, we talk about uh, change of values and culture, and, and I think culture really shapes who we are as a society and what we do. And Google Zeitgeist is an interesting project. It takes the most searched queries in a specific year, a specific location, geographical location, gives you the results. So I was looking at Italy in 2012, the how-to, because we want to learn. So the how-to something. The most searched query, can you guess what it was? By the way, I'm Italian, just as a side note. Come on, guesses. Any guess? How to cook? How to cook? Oh, no, but could have been. How to train. Mm -mm. How to what? How to learn. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> How to have sex. Um, OK, so that's what we care about. Um, what about Norway? <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses? The same. The same? <laughs> Actually, it wasn't even in the top 20. <laughs> Think about that for a second. <laughs> Walk in the 
Nope. Something else? Mm -mm. Last guess. Come on. <laughs> How to write a CV. <laughs> so this is, this is not a scientific study, but Norway has the lowest unemployment in the world, or among the lowest. And Italy has among the highest unemployment rates in the world. Maybe this has something to do with it. <laughs> I don't know. What I know is that there is a lot to learn uh, and a lot to do. So let's get to it. Thank you. That was really interesting. Oh, thank you. So, for the other one, we had a gift, so you will have the same one. So, we oh. put up a small ecological. Oh, concert, so. nice. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Tak. Uh, I'm here for questions if, if you guys have time. Oh. By the way, uh, uh, any questions? I love questions, please. I spoke too much. Yes? <coughs> you, 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 those graphs of um, revenues and work Yes. you uh, showed us, um, I mean, you, you, you emphasize this on computers. But yeah. Isn't it, isn't it, I mean, it's possible that globalization, where you have uh, businesses uh, establish themselves in low-cost countries. Mm -hmm. That makes the high revenue. Um, sure. And that's nothing to do with robots. Um, so, okay, okay. So, um, outsourcing or you know, opening um, various production plan in plants in um, developing economies. That has been the way of basically using slaves. And now the slaves are the robots. Uh, robots are becoming cheaper. Uh, you've seen in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in uh, China. Um, the standard of living is finally rising. Uh, workers' unions are um, becoming a reality even in those countries, finally. Uh, they're getting more rights. And uh, companies are pushed by two factors. One is the social um, contract is changing in those countries, and that's good for humanity, bad for the companies. But simultaneously, robots are getting better and cheaper. And so they're switching to automation more and more. Um, and so they're bringing back manufacturing, in fact, to developed countries. Because um, to some extent, they still need human slaves, unfortunately. But soon enough, they won't. And in some cases, they're already f doing the switch. So in, in situations where you had maybe hundreds of thousands of workers, now you have only dozens of thousands. In a few years, it will be just a couple of thousand, and then almost nobody. Um, there are uh, plants where uh, they are producing food for thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, and there is only a couple of people on a dashboard and they, with touchscreen devices, and they click through, and they, the robots do everything. So uh, this is going to be more and more uh, the reality. Uh, the present. Is, is that really an advantage for, uh, say, China, with us a gigantic population? Yeah. And most workers are not very well off. I mean, there's a middle class growing, that's okay, but still, there are massive working uh, class um, population. And they, they don't make much on this uh, um, boom. No, they don't. They don't, ma they don't make much. In fact, they will make uh, less and less because they're going to be automated, the jobs, and they will be uns relatively unskilled. The population of China, rural China, that has a good enough level of education, let's say high school, is not nearly as it should be to sustain an economy, a knowledge economy, as it happened in, uh, in other countries. Um, so uh, there is a very good study done by a professor um, in, uh, in Stanford called um, uh, Robert, I uh, uh, can't remember his name. I, I gave a, a talk in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was there too. And he made a 25-year study showing that when the 
the population, the rural population that was educated was lower than X percent. Um, and as opposed to the, let's say, higher class within the country, that maybe had a high 80%, 85%, and the rural was 40%. When the boom happened, the country collapsed. And that's what happened in Mexico. And that's why a lot of people who suddenly have some money, but they have no skills, and then the money is not there anymore because jobs are not there. What do they do? They resort to violence, organized crime, uh, drug cartels, prostitution, and all sorts of illegal activities. So, um, and, and this problem, I think, is going to exacerbate because of the, uh, the lack of jobs. So in the future, there, there will be maybe the need for 1 billion jobs and more than 3, million, 3 billion or maybe 4 billion, 5 billion will be looking for a job. So it will be a gap of two, three, four, five billion jobs that nobody can fill. But then these Chinese shouldn't be very happy about the robots coming. <laughs> then they, they should be worried. <laughs> they should be worried, yes, yes. I mean, in, in the myopic approach, if you are one of the, you know, the top 1%, you don't care because you're going to make money off of the production. But if you look at the social indicators that eventually trickle down, to you as well, because you're less safe in a country that's not stable, then you should be worried in the long term. Absolutely. So and I, would, I, would, I would take one guess that I would, the best for, for our solution is to reduce the population because it's already <laughs> way too big. So uh, I've heard that argument many, of time, many times, and um, reducing the population actually doesn't solve the problem. If, well, morals aside, again, big problem. Um, I don't agree with that morally, but even if we had everybody to agree to reduce the number of people on the planet, almost impossible to do. And I think also wrong. But even if we were able to, we're just procrastinating the inevitable conclusion. Because in an infinite growth paradigm, based on competition and competitive advantage, if you have less people, you're just going to take, you're just going to shift the doomsday a few days into the future. You're not going to solve the problem. You're moving it a little bit far ahead. Just like in most cases, capitalism doesn't solve any of its structural problem. It just moves them around geographically. Yeah. <laughs> so we need, that's why I said that we need, we need to use this kind of reforms and new ways of thinking to change the system, not to keep the system as it is for as long as we can. Because the more we wait, the higher the collapse will be, the, you know, the higher the, the peak will be. And the most disastrous, uh, the fall down. Yes? Yeah, you haven't mentioned climate or CO2 mm. or any of that at all. Just what are your, thought, your thoughts on global warming and the effect? Yeah, good point. Yeah, my fault. I didn't mention it because I wanted to keep it uh, under 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. But yeah, so here I, I spoke mostly just about economics and, and values, but um, seriously, the, the biggest threat that we have is really the, the changes that we're doing to the climate, uh, not just the CO2 levels, which is almost the only thing that it's been talked about in at least the major news outlets. But if you look at the scientific research, almost every um, life supported system on the planet is in a state of decline, from fish stocks to um, the oceans, which provide much of the oxygen, as opposed to uh, the trees in the Amazon that people think provide much, most of the oxygen on the Earth. They don't. They are still very important, but um, the oceans are the most um, uh, exploited place in the, in the planet, and they are also the ones that actually provide most of the life-supporting system for the rest of the uh, entire um, the, 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 um, the ecosystems on the planet and on the... Uh, so. Um, it's, it's a huge challenge that I, I really don't know how to solve because um, certainly carbon tax is not going to solve that. Uh, and certainly, you know, the, the credits, the vouchers, all those, bullshit. I mean, it's bullshit. It, the, the science is fairly clear. 300 parts per million or else. I think last figure was what we are 390. And 400, yeah, 400, and we are hitting, you know, we're going to go 420, 450 before 2050. Last time it happened was 800,000 years ago, and it was, 
you know, it was complete disaster. So I, I, just mind blowing. Um, so on, on a positive note, uh, within 20 years, it is not unlikely that we'll have workable nanotechnology. Uh, when I say workable, I mean not just something that works in a petri dish in a small test environment, but actually something that you can scale up. Um, maybe not scale up in 20 years, but 20 years so we'll have something that, that works, and in 25 to 30 years, something that you can scale. And if you can scale molecular nanotechnology or nanomachines, nanobots, you can essentially do anything you want at the molecular level. And um, in fact, there are already some, some people who are um, trying to find solutions to reverse the process, so carbon storage, um, through nanotechnology. And um, I don't think we should bet our money and our time on that alone. I think we should keep it in mind that it's a possibility, but we should also have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. And I've looked at many proposals. It's done, it doesn't look like we, we even have a plan A so far. So, um, yes? Talk about the prediction you see for about the technology shift and the workforce. Have you ever it would be interesting to see if you have made some thoughts about the Norwegian or the oil and gas industry connection to that? Transforming to a new green energy? The uh, gas? Yeah, oil, from the oil and gas industry. Natural gas, you mean? Oh, no, I mean, generally, in general, oil and gas industry, you know, we have uh -huh, yeah. where a big part of our economy is right. oil and gas in connection with the transforming to the new green energy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So one, one big proposal, which I think is sensible, is to use the um, uh, hydrocarbon energy that we have to transition to uh, more uh, sustainable and renewable energies. I think that's a sensible approach. Um, but using the least amount possible. So um, I, I've seen many proposals, and, and still I, I, I've seen in, in local groups, so local regions, or maybe small countries, uh, Denmark is doing a lot in that. They are already pushing towards, uh, they're already well beyond the 2020, 20% 20, uh, 20 renewable in, by 2020, and they're you know, going forth. There are even some places where it's 100% renewable. The um, city of Capannori in Italy is 100% uh, um, not, not, not only recycling, they've reduced by 90% the production of waste. And then they've recycled 100% of their waste in six months at a lower cost than using incinerators, which, by the way, produce nanoparticles that are harmful and cause cancer. Um, so I see many spots, but I don't see a global effort um, really pushing forward. Uh, and we, we haven't reached an international agreement, so I, I, I don't know how we can work that out. What do you think about the low power nuclear reaction from your, your friend from Italy? Yeah. Um, so. Okay, um, so nuclear has the advantage that it doesn't produce as much CO2, but I think that these advantages or the risks are s so high that it makes no sense to, well, first of all, it makes no sense to build new nuclear plants the way we thought about. Um, and, and, and I think it makes sense to phase out the ones that exist. Uh, low power nuclear reactions, you know, then you, you think about the Low energy. Yes, low energy. Low energy. No, actually, it's, uh, it's like Big Bang, you know, the, the popular term given by journalists. It's uh, low energy nuclear reactions. So I know the research by Focardi and Rossi. Um, unfortunately, they don't publish, so nobody knows how it works, if it works. Uh, supposedly, there was an independent study by a Swedish authority of skeptics and rationalists, uh, scientific community who looked at the device, not from the inside, but they measured input and output to see if it, there were any tricks. And apparently there was an excess amount of energy that could not have been explained by any conventional method, according to their report. So, and then just a couple of weeks ago, there was another confirmation by another group, an independent group, doing the same. But again, until I see what's inside the box, this black box, I'm not going to believe... Uh, anything, you know. Um, I want to see what's inside and understand how it works. And if it works, um, it's weird because potentially you could say you could solve all of the world's problems in a decade, right, with uh, cheap, abundant, uh, almost limitless energy. Because with, you know, a liter of water, of heavy water, deuterium, uh, you, know, you can 
basically produce as much as a tank of gasoline. Uh, but if you don't change your values and you continue to grow exponentially in your energy consumption and you have limitless energy, uh, thermodynamics is going to hit very soon and we're going to boil, like literally boil. Um, in my book, there is actually a calculation made by this professor of physics at the University of Southern California, Tom Murphy, who explains, it's called galactic scale energy. And um, here's the energy consumption in all forms since 1650. It's an exponential curve. 400 years of data exponentially growing. So you just take it to the next level. In a mere 270 years following this path, the Earth's surface covered with solar panels at the impossible efficiency of 100%. Well, never mind that we're if you cover the whole planet, and then you know we all die. But who cares? We need energy, right? Um, in just 270 years, you've used all of the energy that hits planet Earth. So, um, and even if you have cold fusion or whatever, it's just going to be a little more down the path, but not a plan for galactic survival. I don't know. Yes. So, someone else said, "Yeah, uh, if you want to, if we want to do something with the problems, yeah, do you think the political way is the way to go, or like you like starting a company and trying to solve some of the problems?" Life is exploring. Yeah. yeah, I think it's always um, it's always a good solution to put to put not of the not, not not all the eggs in the same basket. So what I'm trying to do is innovation through uh, a company which has a social goal, and we're gonna go, we're gonna give the tools for free because we believe in freedom and open source and blah blah blah. Uh, but if the government doesn't help us or work with us or understand what we do. Uh, eventually we're going to hit problems. And if they did understand and helped, it would be so much easier. So we need somebody working in policy, and we need somebody working in entrepreneurship, we need somebody working as a scientist, uh, others, and you know, we need different approach towards the same goal. So as long as we agree on the goal, I think we are diverse enough to come up with the right solutions. Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to shift to something else. You also talked about open sources. Um, and you, then you focused on education. Mm -hmm. But you also said something about research. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm just wondering, because I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very good to talk about open source, where you share information between uh, nations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's great. But, as long as different nations have different laws about how such information that we share, yeah. you're going to have a problem with countries that may not want to share, yeah. but they are very interested in getting stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, this has to be, I mean, this has to be an international solution. Yeah. It's, it's not a national solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think we are still not there because we need an international agreement. So. There are two ways of solving that problem. One is to just go ahead with it and uh, demonstrably open source at the end wins. Look at uh, Android and Apple. The closed proprietary system works better at the beginning because they had a huge investment of billions and billions. Um, and so they had a head start. Open source is slow to gather and it's a chaotic process, but eventually catches up and it becomes viral. So eventually it wins in, in the medium to long term. So one approach is to just go ahead with it and say, we're going to do it anyway. And then it takes a little bit more time. And the other is, uh, I think, very interesting is the pledge. With the, the interesting thing about the pledge is when you say, I pledge to X and Y, you're not actually committing in doing it next year or this year with the fear that someone else is not going to do it and they're going to be more competitive than you. With the pledge, you say, I will do it if everyone else does it. And if you get everybody to agree, then suddenly you have an international agreement. So in many, uh, in many cases, pledges, um, international pledges have worked. That's how, um, uh, in, I don't remember the, the exact cases, but um, Declaration of Human Rights, uh, um, the nuclear uh, pro proliferation was actually the opposite. Uh, the United States, they were playing this game theory kind of thing with the Soviet Union. They said, OK, we're going to reduce the number of atom bombs, just even if you don't do it. And tit for tat, 
they reduced, they reduced, they reduced. So someone has to start. And, and uh, I think, you know, the Nordic countries, uh, they are probably forward looking enough to, to actually start and to be an example to others. It would be great. W what if Norway said, okay, starting 2014, all medical research public, publicly funded, all scientific research publicly funded, all will be open sourced? Everything. But I mean, like in countries like the US, I mean, how, how much research there is publicly fund, public funded and how much is private funded? I mean. uh, most is, is, is a combination. And, uh, and if you have a viral uh, license like the GPL, the general public license, an equivalent for medical research or scientific research, it, it states that if you use any code or any result in this case that comes from a GPL licensed project or research, the derivative has to be open source as well. So it's, it's literally a viral license. Suppose you have um, a poll of results within a, the same project, but to get there, you need something that was released under a GPL license. As soon as you use that, everything else becomes open source automatically. That's how open source became the most widely licensed, uh, most widely used license in the world for software. But still, you know, it seems to me that this, this system will look very vulnerable for, for companies that are not interested in sharing, not interested well, in social issues at all, but they're just interested in making money, which is the biggest point of having a company. Um, yeah, but if you look at, um, so, Let's take the example of, now, a lot of, a lot of companies, especially in the medical research industry, they're not, uh, the medical industry, they're not even patenting. They're, they, want, they prefer to keep the industrial secret, because when you patent, you have to actually publish what you've done, and you have supposedly a number of years in which you, you are the only one who can use that. Um, well, since laws are not uh, transnational, India doesn't care. So India has, is constantly producing drugs that come out directly out of US patents and they don't pay the patents and when the fine comes they're like hey we're not a US territory <laughs> um, if Europe started to open their research and an American company makes money off of it okay but who cares if we can provide Europeans with the drugs at a very low cost that they need because the research was open and anybody can use it um, and if you make it um, like a GPL, a company, by law, cannot take that and close it, right? And have an industrial secret on it. So um, I think we need to find, and it, so the, the, the Creative Commons license is now accepted in something like more than 100 countries. If you publish something under, under a GPL, sorry, a Creative Commons compatible license for medical research or for scientific research, you have immediately all these 100 plus countries who agree that that is the case. So you already have an agreement at the global level. Yes? Count on open source and why it's a good thing? Because if, if you don't have open source, if you keep it to your chest, then someone else is going to reinvent it. And Perfect. Yes. Everyone comes up with the same bad idea. Exactly. exactly. Reinvent the wheel hundreds of times. Another thing that um, most people fail to realize is that it's, it's important not just to publish uh, results, but non-results. More than 90% of research could just goes nowhere. But you don't publish because you don't want to look bad. Or you don't want to let your competitors know what you did wrong. So most research, especially in the medical industry, this is never published. Most negative results are never ever published. And an independent study that was done recently showed that um, some research has been developed or done more than 20 times unbeknown to the researchers. Just, just, just think about the waste of cognitive potential and, and money and, and time and lives that have been lost and broken or uh, you know, people have died because of this. So we need to start. We need to start open what we do. And um, I think North Europe is a very good candidate for actually 
being the virtuous example of saying, okay, we're going to start anyway. And if you don't want to do it, who cares? We're going to save as many people as possible. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. What would you say is the difference between communism and open source, except uh, that you don't need the same amount of uh, label with an open source, with the new technologies? Uh -huh. I don't know. It's the same difference between, uh, between fascism and uh, communism, or uh, you know, be between anything and anything else. It's as far as you can, uh, you can think of. I mean, like uh, with com communism in ideal uh, circumstances, not the way communism is used, but in ideal, they where you have everything is in a way free and it's funded through a central system. Right, it's no. not a central system. It's exactly the opposite. It's a, it's, it's the most decentralized system you can imagine. Open source. Uh, but uh, where does, like, for example, software company? Yeah. Uh, where does the soft software company gets their money from if their things are open source? If for a global system uh -huh. with open source, where does the money? They, for example, get the expertise, like Opera, they have it's an open source browser, but uh, mm. they, they have then the expertise in that area and they sell those services to other companies. But do you think that's, so that's, that's a good example. So in a, in a, in a diverse and chaotic system uh, where you have no single source of revenue or distribution, or um, you have things uh, spontaneously emerging. So you have uh, as, soon, as soon as you give people freedom, amazing things emerge. Crowdfunding was a, something that didn't even exist as a concept uh, five or six years ago, and now everyone knows Kickstarter. Uh, so that's just one example. There might be many things. There are cooperatives that have been going around for hundreds of years. Um, uh, governments may be involved. Individual companies may be involved. And imagine that when you're, when you're describing something like this evolving, you're not starting from scratch. It's not like you're starting from zero. No one has money, no one has resources, no one has capital, no one has physical properties. Uh, you still have this planet with this world, with the people and the companies and the organizations and the structures and the laws. And so when you're open sourcing, you're not starting from zero and suddenly, oh, where do you get the money or where do you get the resources? Um, you basically just have more availability given the circumstances that are already in place. So you're just basically making things more free and more open, and everyone benefits. And the capital is already there. Yeah. Yeah, because I think of the, there are so many companies today that earn their money on making information. Right. And if, if that information is, and many companies are very good at making information, but they still need funding to make sure. that information. Sure, but you know, I think um, with an open source society, money becomes less and less le relevant to the point where basically it becomes uh, almost obsolete. Because the things you need for not just survival, but a, a very um, decent standard of living will be essentially free and available to all. Not limitless, but essentially available, right? So it's, it will be a society of uh, open access instead of, so I, I, I don't really subscribe to the guaranteed uh, income uh, um, proposal because it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, address the, the, the main issue, which is money in the first place. Um, but with an open source society, it becomes less relevant. If we reach this open source society, but we still have no jobs, what are our new motives for living? <laughs> What's your name? Fionn. Fionn. Do you like to play some instruments? No? You don't play music? Do you watch movies? You listen to music. Why? Do they pay you? <laughs> Why do you listen to music? It's enjoyable. Yeah. So there you have your answer. Well, um, I was going to ask a question. Also, I invited some other people from another event. We had. Yeah. There, I told them that you would talk a little bit about social entrepreneurship. Mm. Because I've been an entrepreneur before, but also social entrepreneurship means not just making profit, right. but also doing it ethically, thinking of the environment, yeah. and also culture. And we're at, there was actually another event called Future Coffee, where we get donated food from the stores, and we make a free dinner. Mm. And people come not just for the free food, but here to talk, and that's what people pay. But they were kind of curious about, I know very well what social entrepreneurship is. Right. So, so they, that answers some of the questions here. Absolutely. So the company that I started, Explory, is, um, it is a company done with the idea of social entrepreneurship, which is basically, um, there, there has been this dichotomy of profit and non-profit for a long time. 
And I think this dichotomy is um, wrong and uh, detrimental uh, because it kind of gives the idea that if you, if you do something that's good for the planet and for the people, um, Uh, so this one, okay. <laughs> uh, if you do something that's good for the people and the planet, uh, it must be non-profit. Um, otherwise, you really have a second motive, which is making money. So in, in, in many cases, that's true. Um, but in social entrepreneurship, um, you recognize as an entrepreneur that you have to play with the cards you have. So in this system, uh, money is the way that you keep organizations going and people um, doing what they love, having a substance, uh, having a way of living. So if you are mission driven, right? So this is the mission. This is my mission and this is what I work for. So I don't care if this, between decision A, B, C and D, C makes more profit or D makes more profit. My question is always, which one is going to bring me closer to this, the mission? And basically you're saying it's, a, it's not a nonprofit because we're using the money to reach the mission. And you're not relying on grants, which is paralyzing. Because if you're a nonprofit, you're, you're waiting for someone to donate or to ask for grants. And between 50 and 90% of the time spent by people working in nonprofits is spent raising money. Raising money. So basically, you become, again, a money making scheme, even if you are a nonprofit, because you're spending the time trying to look for money. Most of your time. And I think that's, uh, that's paralyzing because you're never doing the actual outreach for the mission. So I'm, I, I think um, that now there are enough people who understand that um, you can use innovation in a positive way to reach. Uh, certain goals and if your goals are big and uh, inspire a lot of people they're gonna follow you and they're gonna give you their time their money or uh, uh, their hearts and their dreams and their ideas um, and so th there is this, this new wave that's been um, really exploding in the last uh, five or six years called social entrepreneurship and um, and there are many examples of this and one is a very interesting movement uh, uh, that has a legal a representation which is called the benefit corporation so benefit corporation is basically just like a corporation in the sense that it has a, a board members a CEO makes profits and blah 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 but the mission is an actual stakeholder so at the end of the year if you're not if you are skewing from the mission it's as important as if you were skewing from profits or even more important in fact so you have to basically respond to an independent party who audits you every year and looks at what you've done. And if what you've done goes against your mission, they take away your uh, status of benefit corporation. Is so, like corporate governance? No, no, no it's, it's, a different, uh, it's a different idea. So the Wikipedia and other similar projects is run, uh, are run by the Wikimedia Foundation. And the Wikimedia Foundation is a benefit corporation. Um, Couchsurfing, do you guys know what Couchsurfing is? Okay, you, you have a couch, you let people stay in your house to sleep on your couch for free. Okay, there is no money involved. The organization that runs this website is a benefit corporation. And the reason is just because it's more flexible than a nonprofit. And you're not wasting your time looking for money, uh, but you're using the money you're making to um, improve your mission, to move towards your mission. Yes. Um, have you heard about the RepRap project? Yeah. yeah. I have it here in one of my other slides. Okay. Mm. Well, I mean, I just I mean, because there's a lot of people who, after that project came or got off the ground, there's a lot of people who make money around that project. Uh -huh. And, you know, who cares what people <laughs> are participating? There's an avatar in the room. So that's exploring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's in 15 languages, I think, 18 languages. If Norwegian is not there, 
you can you can make the subtitles for the video. Okay. I'm actually helping someone translate a book right now. Well, <laughs> excellent. Sorry, you were saying rap rap people made money off of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Red Hat. Red Hat is an open source company. Uh, in, you got, now it's called, you know, they made a distribution called Fedora, but Red Hat is an enterprise solution. They're open source and they are worth more than $1 billion. And they're open source. Mm. So there are absolutely ways of working within the system and releasing your knowledge um, as open source. Sorry? No, no, I know. I was giving a, another example of a, a company that has, well, RepRap is a project. It's a 3D printer, which is um, hopefully at some point we'll be able to self-replicate. So if you can imagine, now it's about 65% uh, replicable. So it can print. It's, a, it's like a printer, but prints in 3D. And this particular model can print up to 65% of itself. So imagine in a few years, a molecular Something that prints at a molecular scale, almost any atom of the periodic table, any molecule you can imagine, including, of course, itself. So what do you need an industry that makes anything for? When you can make literally anything out of uh, previously considered garbage, molecularly decompose what's in the landfills, have all the elements lined up as your ingredients, and make anything for free, essentially forever, because atoms can be recycled. And the energy that you need to run the 3D printer can come from the sun, so it's free again. And the solar panel that you are using to capture the energy, you 3D printed that. <laughs> so in a few years, literally everything will be free. If we open source things. But now they're already trying to put DRM, digital rights management. They're like kind of locks that prevent you from doing certain things. Like, have you ever seen that commercial? Um, Would you ever steal a car? Would you ever steal from an old lady? You know, that piracy commercial. And now they did, Would you ever 3D print a car? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, it's called uh, the DefCAD project. Yeah, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen the three yeah, yeah, his name is Corey, um, Corey something, I know him. Um, <laughs> <he's a laughs> so um, he's an interesting fellow because he started with the idea of, OK, let's put cartridges and parts of guns and even now a full-fledged gun that shoots bullets and can kill people as a, an open source 3D project. Yeah. You don't give a gun to a kid, and that's the thing that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he originally started with that, and then he took upon himself like this crusade of making anything that the companies didn't want you to have. So teeth, medical devices, prosthesis, uh, parts of your car, glasses, anything. Right? The companies don't want you to produce yourself. Um, and his argument is uh, we shouldn't restrict people from having or not having something because it's delusional. We're going to move in a world where anybody can have anything. And that's his argument. And I think he's right um, in that it's inevitable. Um, and because it's inevitable, I think we should, be, we should be working on our values. Like, Why would you 3D print a gun to kill someone if it doesn't make any sense, right? I think very few people here in Europe, especially in Norway, would do that. In the US, everyone goes crazy for that. Like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I need to protect my family. Yeah, so, you know, um, there was a great quote, I think by William Gibson uh, on, on, on Twitter just a few days ago, he said, if your perception of security is related to, it, 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 if, 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 no, wait, it's, it was something like, if when, I, if, if when I utter the word security, you think of a weapon and not of access to health, then you're really fucked up in the head. 
or something like that. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm probably going off on a tangent, but back to social entrepreneurship. Yeah. Do you know any, uh, tangent, tangent, tangent. Uh, back to the thing I invited a few other people to hear about, because um, there's yeah. quite a few people who are in biochemistry. Yes. Uh, actually doing so let me open up another, another slide, slide that I have. Social, about, more about social entrepreneurship. Okay, so let me open up um, this that I did. You know, I'm very curious what you said too about mentorship. Because yeah. I've had mentors who have been older than me and are younger than me. Uh -huh. I have a very good friend who's a mentor who actually yeah. got his doctorate at MIT in genetics. Yeah. And he's brilliant and he's younger and he's one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. But he shares information with me, not only through Gmail and Twitter, but he and I, the third person in uh, France, we all talk about new technologies. And we're mentoring each other. But I'm curious, as a social entrepreneur, we want to start a company or something. Yeah, so, um, so in, in, in Silicon Valley, the, the idea of, um, and not only Silicon Valley, but also other startup scenes, there is a similar one in uh, New York, in uh, Berlin, uh, uh, a little bit in uh, Copenhagen, maybe. So, but the idea is you have um, either incubators or um, programs where you basically go there and share. Right, so there are co-working spaces, there are um, uh, groups that um, you share knowledge with and you share experiences and you, you make friends and, and, um, and, and it's, it's really based on a, on a network of trust. So when you have a great idea or a great passion and mission and you need help fulfilling that, if you enter one of these groups, and there are many of them. Uh, some, some, some are called accelerators. Well, then some are incubator group then. Incubators, yeah. So um, in, in Silicon Valley, it's different because even if you're not in an incubator or an accelerator, uh, basically anywhere you go, you meet some sort of entrepreneur who will give you information or connections or advice for free. It, it's a paid forward mechanism. and, and and that's why I think in Silicon Valley there is this, this huge level of innovation because they've been doing this for some 20 years and now this paid forward mentality has really paid off because you have a disproportionate number of um, projects and social projects all in the same area. And uh, so your question was about how to... Well, the question is to be a social entrepreneur and somehow create this kind of a network. Right. So one would be to, um, to join one of the existing uh, accelerator groups. Uh, or, uh, um, so there is one called the F6, uh, um, FS6 uh, or something. That's the largest um, aggregator of all accelerators in the world. Um, that has a list of hundreds of them um, in Europe, in, but in the United States, in Africa, and uh, you know, everywhere. And one would be just to show up there. So in New York, there is one called General Assembly. Um, in uh, yeah, you just show up and you have people, and you know y there are courses. You um, it's, it's 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 really cool. Uh, General Assembly, uh, but there are many. Any other names uh, top of your head? Uh, well, General Assembly is closing actually, and it's not free. But uh, I think there are free co-working spaces. The courses spaces. are not free, but... Uh, no, staying there is not oh, free really? either. Yeah, real estate in New York is too expensive to do that. In Brooklyn, they have co-working spaces. But I think it, uh, unfortunately, from what I understand, Berlin does better because uh, it's a real estate issue. Okay. Um, but you can hold meetings there if you call them ahead of time for right. free. So, 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 there, so there are many um, examples of global um, reach. One is Singularity University is building a global network. Uh, we're now in about 60 countries and uh, for each country we have a um, an ambassador that organizes uh, local events or local meetings and basically creates network uh, of people who want to have a positive large impact on the planet. Um, so Singularity University is one such group. Another one is the Teal Fellowship. The, they have this program called 20 Under 20. They choose 20 people under 20 years of age. They give them $100,000 uh, in two years. Is that correct? Yeah. 
to basically pursue their dream and their passion and whatever they, they, they want. Um, and the, the deal is that they, they don't go to college. Uh, uh, so to accept that, they, 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 they should drop out of school, basically. Uh, but, you know, that's a bit extreme. But uh, th there are many. And if you go to Wikipedia and you search um, uh, accelerators or uh, uh, social, th 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 there, there is a very large list. Um, in my personal experience, uh, once you start entering in just one of them, then it's almost irrelevant uh, uh, knowing about any, any other one because they're all connected. And you all meet the same people. And, you know, I'm in Taiwan. I'm meeting this guy who was in New York. And we have a common friend. And uh, you are in Silicon Valley. You meet this guy from Berlin who is a common friend of the... It's, it's always the same family. You know, there, there are not many, unfortunately, people who are actually trying to do something for um, the planet in that... Uh, in that mentality of social entrepreneurship. But one of the um, things that I wanted to share that you reminded me of is like this one, the X Prize. How many of you know about this project? OK, so started by Peter Diamandis, the guy who started Singularity University. They take challenges that no one has been able to solve uh, in the history of humanity. And they say, OK, we're going to put up a $10 million prize. And whoever solves it first, they're going to get the money. And we're going to put the, the results for free as open source. So like. Hey, can we make the medical recorder of Star Trek? Kind of a device that you hold in your hand and you diagnose any problem, any mental or physical or you know, anything that, you know, mostly physical, but any medical diagnosis better than a board of certified doctors done with a device that costs pennies. Or a device you already have and the software is, is costs pennies. So this is, these are a few. Like there is the open source tricorder, Scanadu. These are also my friends, uh, the, uh, Singularity, uh, NASA Ames Research Park. They came out with uh, an Indiegogo campaign. They raised more than a million. You know, we have to close? No, no, we don't have to close. But I think we take two more questions. Or OK. So yeah, uh, another one was the, um, can you make a car? Right? Can you make a car that runs? Um, 100 miles, per, 100 miles per gallon, which is 45 kilometers per liter, equivalent. So it could be running anything, but the equivalent has to be that. Can you make it? In 150 years, no one, no car manufacturer has ever been able to make it. They do it. Two years later, these guys win 43 kilometers. Uh, it was 40, so 43 kilometers per liter car. Um, and this. Lithium-ion motor. So this is an electric vehicle doing 79 kilometers per liter equivalent. And the guys who make this, they had almost no knowledge of how to make a car just a few years prior. Right. Or um, the oil cleanup challenge. Right. So in this one, they said they took the technology to um, clean the oil that spilled hasn't changed for 25 years, basically. There's no incentive because they're very rare. And when it happens, you're like, oh, shit. And you basically you know, collect even the hair of people, millions of people cutting their hair and to collect it. It's just kind of weird in 2013 still doing this. Do you guys remember the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico that happened last year? So $1.4 million to double the cleanup rate here. One of the teams that participated and actually um, achieved that, tattoo artist. He met, let's see, Fred Giovannitti, right? He was basically, he, he, he was in Las Vegas with a few friends. He saw on TV the XPRIZE uh, for oil cleanup. And he was like, yeah, I'm pretty upset about you know, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I think I'll do it. He found five friends, and he doubled the cleanup rate that you know, the industry hasn't been able to do for uh, ever. Um, so that was you know, in the Netherlands I was giving this conference. But yeah, basically, you know, yeah, go to a fab lab, a tech shop, noise bridge. Or, I mean, this is San Francisco, but hacker spaces, maker fair, biocurious. This is really cool if you're doing biotechnology. They're, they're hacking DNA and bacteria and all sorts of things with 
tabletop devices that cost, you know, that they're, they're taking old printers, they're extracting um, DVD uh, players and using them to um, basically uh, separate uh, microRNA and uh, so they're doing all sorts of amazing things. So, for example, these guys at Singularity University, the graduate study program of this year, one of the projects was this. So, screen many types of cancer using microRNA and what they're doing is um, detecting cancer before symptoms appear, right? So, and the way they did this was to use a Blu-ray disc. So it's available for less than 100 euros, and you are detecting almost any type of cancer with an accuracy greater than the millions and millions of euros worth of technical equipment that the best research centers have. And they made it in five weeks, four people using a DVD player, essentially, a Blu-ray player. So something that's available in every house, and this could potentially change the entire history of humanity, because you can detect cancer before it happens, at a cost of a few cents. And these guys, Micromeds, um, they developed a device that costs $100, and the prototype it could cost much less if it's um, uh, produced on a mass scale, to detect malaria even in uh, healthy carriers. So one of the problems with malaria is basically it's an invisible um, uh, sickness many of the times because you can be carrying malaria without displaying the symptoms. But you can still infect all of your village uh, unless you actually do a test. But why would you do an expensive test that requires a microscope? Most villages in Africa and India don't have a microscope if you don't have a reasonable doubt that this person has malaria. Well, if you had a device like this, costs less than $100 and can work in high humidity, high temperature, anywhere, you can even submerge it in water and still works, you can go in any village and just go one by one and do every single person that's there. What's your time scale? Uh, I, I, can, I can finish any moment. No, I'm just thinking, could you go on for another half an hour afterwards? Uh, uh, so okay, my suggestion is... Okay, last question. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so th these are the kinds of things that, that I'm talking about, right? Get involved with places like Singularity University or other uh, groups that are doing this kind of entrepreneurship. And uh, you will find projects like this, like that can actually save billions of lives uh, through interesting projects. And uh, BioCurious is, uh, is from San Francisco. Start the BioCurious. I know the founder. You send me an email, I'll put you in touch with him, uh, and uh, he will tell you all about it. How to open a hacker space for uh, biotechnologists. I was, I was sequencing DNA with, with, with no prior knowledge of biology in four hours. How hard can it be? <laughs> you guys are studying it, so. Any other questions? So how do you make money? <laughs> Me? Yes. Um, I'm looking for um, angel investors called impact investors. They are investors who understand the, what you're trying to do. So with Explorey, my company, we are trying to secure the first round of funding, which is called seed funding or angel funding. Um, um, we are in discussion with a few, but we are open to um, uh, we, you know, we're willing to speak to anybody who understands what we're doing and is willing to help. Okay. Thank you.